All right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about Apache Metron, which is a very recent um, top-level project in Apache. Uh, and we're going to be talking about Metron as a case study for a modern streaming architecture on Hadoop. I think that some of the things that we're doing in Metron is, are kind of novel, and I want to talk to you guys about them. OK. So I'm Casey Stella. I'm the vice president of um, the Apache Metron project. <clears throat> uh, I'm a PMC member and a committer as well. Uh, and I'm also an engineer and data scientist at Hortonworks. So my background is in data science. My background is in Hadoop. So kind of those, kind of, those things folded together when constructing Metron, when, ha when helping kind of design Metron, we really wanted to build something that was able to do really advanced analytics, right? And we wanted to build something that was able to do that very adaptively. So Metron as an application is uh, in the security space, in the cybersecurity space, and um, it's, a, it's an application for doing advanced security analytics um, on streaming data, essentially. So it uh, would fall into the broad category of uh, intrusion um, <clears throat> intrusion detection threat hunting s style system. Uh, in order to do, uh, so Metron was initiated at Cisco as OpenSOC, um, and they presented here. Actually, I was in the in the talk uh, as an audience member at the time. <clears throat> um, in 2014, uh, they open sourced it, and um, Hortonworks, along with a number of other, um, along with another. another uh, a, a, a number of other companies uh, sponsored uh, Metron to become uh, incubated through the Apache Incubator in uh, December 2015. And after a while, it took us, uh, we graduated as a top level project just in April. So uh, it's been a, that's kind of the road for Metron. Um, so Metron's built a, a top Hadoop. So what we needed was a scalable solution, really. So we wanted to build on top of the best of breed. Um, uh, technologies that provided that. So in particular, we're built on top of Kafka. Uh, Kafka provides us a unified data bus. Um, <clears throat> we're built on top of Storm for the distributed compute. We're heavy users of HBase to provide a low latency key value lookup for enrichments. So really about streaming applications, what you really want to do, be able to do in order to do analytics is to bring as much context to bear at the point of the data flowing through the system as possible. Being able to do these large-scale key value lookups in HBase scalably is a, is a differentiator. We also use it for enrichments, like I just said, as well as profiles, which I'll get to later on. We use Zookeeper aggressively. So um, as opposed to a lot of um, Storm, uh, a lot of the approaches around distributed systems are it's a configure and then deploy type system. We try to fix the topology. We do a deploy and then modify the configuration live as the data streams through. What we don't want to do is to, is to spin down topologies and to spin down um, infrastructure systems that have to interact with ops guys uh, in order to add a new enrichment, right? <clears throat> so we use Zookeeper a lot for that kind of stuff, <clears throat> which is its intended purpose, um, and in line with most of the other Hadoop projects, too. So ingested telemetry data, network telemetry data can be enriched pluggably. So the other thing is we really want to build a system that's pluggable. We want to be able to have users, analysts in particular, um, easily be able to enrich their data to get exactly what they want to see at, out of the other end. All right. So new enrichments can be done live without restart, like I said, by use of Zookeeper. Um, <clears throat> new enrichment capabilities can be specified by user-defined functions. We have a we have a, um, what is largely analogous to, uh, you can think of it as Excel um, functions for big data, right? It's a, it's a little domain specific language that allows function composition and to be able to define some of these rules. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. So uh, those can, the, that particular language is called Stellar. I didn't name it. Um, <laughs> So data stored in HBase can be the source of enrichment. So that's really kind of the, the, the aim around a lot of this, is we want a nice pluggable way so that users don't have to worry about some of the real the finicky parts about interacting with HBase, like key design. We want to be able to, if I have a set of key values, I want to be able to, to use the utility that Metron provides to push that data into HBase and retrieve it back without having to worry about, are my keys uniformly distributed? How do they look like? How do they, you know, et cetera. Okay, so 
Enriched telemetry can be indexed into so a security data lake. We firmly believe in data lakes here at Hortonworks, and we firmly, and I, I firmly believe in data lakes just sort of in general. So you want to, you want to be able to have the historical record as well as an indexed record of your data, so you can cross correlate them. So the historical record for doing things like training machine learning models, for doing things like um, long range um, analysis back in your favorite tools like Hive or whatever, right? Spark, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, we also want to be able to drive dashboards with a real-time index as well. So we support two right now, probably more in the future, Solar and Elasticsearch. <clears throat> the other thing we want to be able to do is to do actual advanced analytics. This is more than just doing simple word counts. This is more than simple counting things. <clears throat> so we want to be able to use probabilistic data structures in order to have lookbacks that are in the, in the realm of months rather than the realm of minutes, right? Advanced actors, advanced breaches, they'll take over a system, they'll wait over the course of six months, seven months. If you're doing user entity behavioral analysis, if you're snapshotting user behavior, you wanna be able to compare it, you wanna be able to compare things across the range of months in order to find the really advanced threats. And being, being able to do that scalably is a real challenge. So we use probabilistic structures to get approximate results, but good enough results in order for analysts to be able to write complex rules and advanced, more advanced rules. So we also want to be able to, so the second range of complexity there is, maybe I don't want to do statistical baselining, maybe I want to actually construct a machine learning model. Well, a good portion of the team actually were data scientists from the field at Hortonworks, so we've seen a lot of the pain around how to interact with models and a lot of the decisions made. So we've constructed a, a tool, a framework called Models as a Service, which uses Yarn to be able to deploy models out without the imposition of, you have to write this in Spark, you have to write this in this library, you have to write this in Java. So if you're interested in that, tomorrow I have a talk just about that. That's, un, that's big enough to, to actually merit its own discussion. So ask me later, or you can come to my talk tomorrow, talk about that. But it's, it exists within Hadoop. So. Okay, so Stellar. It bears talking a little bit about Stellar, because Stellar is our point of extension. The justification for this is that security analysts are not programmers. We want to be able to provide a simple way for security analysts to enrich their data, to provide um, definitions of when something bad has happened, and we want to be able to do that in such a way that um, engineers in the back end can plug in new functions. Right. So think about functions being your, your normal, the normal kind of things that you see in a where clause in a SQL statement, the normal kind of things that you see in an Excel you know, transformation, right? things like two, um, two upper. Um, but also specific things like, <clears throat> uh, specific things around network security, like is this, is, is this IP in this particular IP range? Right? Stuff like that. Um, so it, it interacts, it needs to interact with the various enabling Hadoop components in a unified manner. I want to be able to pull, go out to HBase and get an enrichment, right? There's functions around that. I want to be able to interrogate a model. There's functions around that. <clears throat> so we want to be able to take these and compose them as well. And also provide simple primitives around these functions, Boolean operations, being able to say if this condition is true and this condition is true, or these sets of conditions are true, right? Those, kind of, those kinds of things. And also some numerical computation, being able to do operations like, is this value minus this value more than five, five times this other value for a standard deviation statistical baseline type of operations. So really think of Stellar as Excel functions that we can run on streaming data. It's simplified. It's not a programming environment. It's not Turing complete. But it's just enough to, get, to enable people who are not programmers to effectively use the system without having to know about the Hadoop components underneath the hood. OK. So, the first part of this journey, um, three or four parts actually, is parsers. The first thing we need to be able to do is take the telemetry data in the format that it comes out. So when I say telemetry data, I mean things like the output of uh, a deep packet inspection tool like Bro, um, an output of another um, <clears throat> threat hunting and alerting tool like Snort. Right? I want to be able to pull that into the system because one of the benefits of Metron is we want to be able to pull in and enrich as much data as possible at the same time and cross-correlate. So 
the telemetry sources are ingested into Kafka, so however you get into Kafka. Oftentimes we see people using NiFi. If it's, if it's something like Bro, we have specific plugins. We also have a, a, um, a, a packet, a, a PCAP um, sensor that, that, we, that, that we built around DPDK for, uh, low co for um, commodity hardware-based ingestion of packet capture data. So that's not gonna be talked about in this, in this but you can come ask me later on. Uh, we have a storm parser topology that converts the raw telemetry format into a normalized JSON map. But we're, when I say normalized JSON map, what we really mean is we're not really, we're not constructing a data model and imposing a data model on you guys. You kind of construct your own data model. <clears throat> we want to be able to, but we do want to be able to do things like allow you to, um, to specify your own fields, allow you to do transformations of those fields. Right, if I have a domain name that comes in, I want to strip off the TLD because maybe my machine learning model takes that as an input. Or maybe I want to strip off the subdomains. Or maybe I just want to look at the subdomains, stuff like that. So uh, we support common network-related raw telemetry formats like ASA, right, um, like Bro, things like that. Um, in addition, we also support generic formats like CSV and JSON. So if your data is in a JSON blob or your data is in a CSV, it's super easy to construct a parser. It's just configuration, code-free development. If it's a little bit more complicated um, and it fits uh, something that we can, we can pick apart with regular expressions, we support a Grok-based um, parser as well. So Grok is, you can think of it almost as a mapping between fields and regular expressions so that you can say this field is this, is this bit of the, of the, of the line. But if none of that works for you, you can actually construct your own JVM-based parser. But that's kind of the last resort. We prefer code-free um, type solutions to this particular problem. <clears throat> and then after that, after the fact, you can do trans further transformations with Stellar. So anything you can do in Stellar, so Stellar is sort of the unified enrichment and transformation environment and language that you can use everywhere inside of Metron. So normalized data across telemetry, then written to an enrichment topic, which brings us to, so this is the actual picture of the, of the topic. So after we've, after we've normalized it, what we want to do is to be able to enrich the data. We want to be able to do things like um, pull in more context. So the topology is here. It, um, the storm topology pulls from Kafka. Uh, it parses and normalizes, parses and normalizes, and writes out to Kafka. If any errors happen, they write out to Kafka and errors are indexed along with your data. So you can see the errors in your dashboards as soon as they happen. Okay, so enrichments. The enrichment topology takes the various normalized telemetry sources. Now that they're in, now that they're in a normalized manner, we can operate on them, we can enrich on them. Right? <clears throat> so we can enrich with reference data that we've previously ingested into HBase. So that can be things like, um, uh, I have a malicious IP address list that I got from a third party vendor. I've imported that into, it, it comes in as, as a taxi feed and I have a taxi loader that will push that data into HBase. We have a taxi loader in, in, inside of Metron. And as the data flows through, I wanna know, it, are my users connecting to uh, an IP address that is flagged as malicious from one of the third party vendors, right? That's an example of an HBase enrichment. <clears throat> Uh, you can also enrich by arbitrary stellar expressions. So you can do things like interact, you can do things like um, modify the fields. If you, wanna, if you wanna take a domain name, strip off the subdomains. Uh, if you wanna take a, a field and normalize the case, stuff like that. <clears throat> we can also enrich with geolocation data. So we have, we have support for being able to tag an IP address with its geolocation information. And that's useful for downstream processing. Um, for analysts, it's also possibly useful for machine learning models around this. this is an important feature. So enrichment split into two phases, really. Uh, the first phase is a preparatory phase <clears throat> where you're, you're kind of staging your data, you're getting as much context in that message as possible, as fast as possible, as scalably as possible. And then the second phase is a threat intelligence phase. So that's when we really want to say, okay, given the best information that I have, is this particular field, is this particular message indicate a threat given all the context that I've built up in the previous phase, right? Is this, is this IP address uh, in a malicious domains, like, in a malicious IP list, right? Does my machine learning model say that this is likely a threat, right? Um, 
and you can give the, you can give a message multiple scores. You could say, okay, if this is the case, then I want the score to be 10. If this is the case, I want the score to be 100. Because one of the things that we noticed is analysts are drowning in false positives. We really need to be able to prioritize and focus their attention. So being able to focus their attention, this is how we do it. So we have, if messages are marked as an alert, we can now score them and then triage that. We can roll up the scores into an overall score so that when analysts look at their dashboard in Metron, they can see, oh, okay, this is alert is 100. I care about that way more than this alert that's 10. And you'll see an example of that in the demo later on. Okay, so we have a proper stellar enrichment as well. That's like our main enrichment. Um, you, can, you can extend Stellar by adding new user-defined functions by dropping a jar in, a, in HDFS, and it will pick it up. Right? So that's one of the things that we really wanted to be able to do is to be able to allow, it, allow people to, be, to, to very easily extend and write their own user-defined functions with sort of no impact. Uh, user-defined functions are written in, in Java. It's just a matter of um, implementing an interface. Analysts would not be writing their own functions, they would be using existing functions. Engineers would be writing those functions to extend based on whatever specific environment that they're in. But hopefully the idea is to be able to use the existing ones that we have from 90, for 80 to 90% of the cases. So stellar enrichments can be executed asynchronously. So you'll see this in the topology later on. It's a bit, it's slightly interesting, I think, um, from a storm perspective. We're doing this split join. So we are um, essentially, because we, we own the language in Stellar, we can do things like take the message, and I know that this, this set of Stellar expressions and this set of Stellar expressions are independent. So they can be run independently in different storm workers asynchronously, and then we can join them together later on. So, if I'm, so the, where this becomes important is if I'm doing multiple HBase calls, I don't wanna run those serially. I wanna be, able, most, of the, most of the time, the output of one, one a set of expressions does not depend on the output of another set of expressions. I wanna have this HBase enrichment and this HBase enrichment, which are completely different. And I wanna be able to run those independently. And we, you can do that. <clears throat> so we provide things like interrogating machine learning models. If you're, more interested, if you're interested in that, you can come to, to my uh, models as service talk later on um, tomorrow. You can read reference data from HBase. You can read historical profiles. We're gonna to get to that later. That's actually another interesting thing, I think, that's, uh, that, that's part of Metron <clears throat> that, that is of interest. All right, so this is the topology. So in addition to the stellar enrichments, we have just sort of a base H-base enrichment that's not very um, generic. Um, not very adaptable, I should say. Anything you can do in these enrichments, you can do inside of Stellar. And you can split the Stellar statements up into um, independent sections and have those, run, have those run concurrently. So the data comes through, message, the, the raw message is sent here, the enriched message is, or the, um, the, the, the partial message is sent for each of the independent sections in Stellar to uh, the Stellar enrichment bolt. That enriched data is then sent over to the joiner and that's joined together in a streaming manner. All right, so this is all happening asynchronously. And the same thing happens here. You can also do further enrichments um, as you're doing the, uh, the, 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 threat, the, the threat intelligence scoring. Um, but for the user, they shouldn't have to know that this is even running on Storm or that any of this happens. They should just need to know, I wanna run these enrichments and they're independent of one another. All right, okay. Um, and once data is enriched, we write out to an index. Right now we support HDFS for our long-term storage index and um, a, the index of your choice, either Solar or Elasticsearch. <clears throat> and then if any errors happen, that gets sent back through Kafka to be indexed later on. So that's kind of the basic life cycle, but I wanna talk a little bit about the profiler. So enrichment and parsing uh, they really operate within the context of a single message. So advanced analytics, the real trick is to bring as much context to bear as possible, All right? <clears throat> so it's just insufficient to operate within the context of a single message if you wanna bring historical context. If I'm doing um, behavioral entity um, snapshotting or, or, or statistical profiling, I need to know historical, I, I need to know historical baselines. 
I need to be able to operate in the, in the past as well as in the present. So we need to be able to correlate between different sources. I need to be able to say things like, if this user has five login events, or has five um, invalid login events, and there was a snort alert associated with this user, then I want, them, I want the, the, uh, the risk score to be 100 as opposed to five. So as the data flows in about the login events, I can now, I, can now, I wanna be able to pull, uh, pull the historical information about the, um, my uh, snort separate telemetry. We need to be able to make judgments based on past events. Has this user had five login events that were incorrect in some way? in the past, or has this user, uh, has this user had the number of log, the number of invalid logins, or the number of, yeah, the number of invalid logins in the last 15 minutes, is it more than five standard deviations away from the number of invalid logins that you, that all users, are, um, that you see of all users, or of just users that have this particular user's um, uh, privileges, right, he's a sysadmin. <clears throat> are both at the same time, frankly. You want to be able to slice and dice this. So the way we do this is, uh, the, some of the problems is operating across multiple sources has some scalability implications. It's, it's tricky to do. Um, waiting on the data from the other stream is not plausible, especially when you want to be able to go back very far. And sometimes you want to change your mind about how far you want to go back. Sometimes your analysts are going to say, really, I want to know six months back. And I want to have very complicated slicing and dicing. Because when we're talking about statistical baselining, your data is likely to be seasonal. Users operate differently in your network on the weekends than they do on the weekdays. They operate differently on holidays than they do on the weekdays. So I want to be able to look at a snapshot across time that skips weekends, that looks at just this hour back. And I want to skip every seven days back for six months, things like that. And advanced actors can wait for months while they, while they slowly map out your network, and it gets lost in the traffic because it's very, it's 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 a trickle of malicious activity. So the compromise here is that we want to operate on windows in time rather than individual records, and we want to be able to do those. Um, we want to be able to specify those windows very flexibly. Like I said, we want to be able to avoid seasonal aberrations, so we want to skip weekends. We want to be able to indicate whether or not we want to to skip holidays. We want to look at. Um, between, the, between the hours of you know, 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. and skip seven days back for six months, right? So the profiler is a storm topology that's gonna to take in rich data. It's, it's gonna capture these aggregations of the data in this window to HBase, and it's gonna use Stellar about to, to define how it aggregates those data. Oops. Uh -uh. So it uses Stellar also to define a filter on which messages to consider. Maybe I only care about messages, maybe I want a, a profile just for users with root access. Or I want a profile with users who are just regular users, not system users, things like that. So those aggregations can be read anywhere that Stellar is used, which is all through the system. So it enables things like temporal outlier detection. So can I look at, I'm, I'm looking at anomalous readings here and suddenly I see a spike. I wanna be able to determine that. Historical context is from other sources when building threat triage rules, like the snort. Had, does there exist a message in snort, in, from snort from this particular IP address? When I'm looking at, uh, when I'm looking at a completely separate telemetry source. So the example aggregations that I'm, I'm talking about are what we really want to be able to do as a first class citizen in, in Metron is distributional statistics. I want to be able to snapshot the distributions of some value over the course of time, and I want to be able to understand deviations from that distribution, right? Set operations, contains and cardinality. Has this happened before? And also, has the, how many times has this happened in a distinct manner? So, how many, so what you're gonna see later on um, is a very good indication of a threat is the number of machines that a user connects to in a distinct manner. So the number of IP addresses they connect to in a distinct manner. So most of the time users operate in a network and they see they operate across the network and they, they go to maybe five distinct 
IP addresses. If a malicious actor is looking through your network and trying to find poke holes in it and peek invul invulnerabilities, he's going to look at a large number of distinct connections. But just because you're looking at five, a small number of distinct IP addresses, maybe you're connecting to them a ton. Right? So what you really want to be able to trend is the distinct number. Also simple counts, frankly, as well. So the challenges that we have is these objects may be big, right? So naively, if we, cap if we need to capture historical state, if I have to capture every record, that's just a non-starter, right? The other problem is it may not be merged across time. Like I talked about, I want to be able to snapshot every 15 minutes, but I want to be able to read six months back, and I want to be able to skip certain bits, and I want to merge that together. So if I'm talking about a distribution, I don't want so, uh, you know, if I have a, I don't want a distribution per 15 minute window, I want the distribution merged together. So I'm looking at operations which, um, for a mathematical term, can be, can form a semi-group. So they can be merged. The other thing is profiles should be decoupled from writing. I want to be able to specify the profiles, uh, I want the analyst to be able to specify the profiles, whereas the operator should be able to configure the, 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 the tick time. So what we're going to use is we're going to look at approximate data structures. So these are, um, <clears throat> these are, these pro these are probabilistic data structures that are sublinear in space. So for set operations, we're going to choose bloom filters. So what approximate data structures mean, uh, means is that these are data structures that form semigroups that can be merged. Um, you will get answers, but you will tolerate some, um, some error, some small error bar. But what you get in exchange for it is Sublinear in space means I can look back six months, I can look back a year, while storing that very, in a very succinct data structure. So Bloom filters, hyperlog log. So Bloom filters for existing stock queries, hyperlog log plus for, um, <clears throat> for distinct cardinalities for sets, and also distributional statistics using T-digests. Okay, so what I wanted to do here is a quick demo um, <clears throat> Los Alamos National Labs, so it's really hard to get cybersecurity data. Turns out people don't really want to give over their entire data for their network. Don't know why. Right. <laughs> Los Alamos National Labs released this big open, this big open source depersonalized data set, which is fantastic. Um, it represents 58 consecutive days of de-identified de data from five sources within Los Alamos National Labs. And this is a, their corporate internal network. At the same time, there were actors maliciously trying to connect and break in. They had a red, they had a, they had a, um, they also have noted a number of instances of where they found these breaches, All right? So we have a situation, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to use Metron to figure out <clears throat> um, how, we're gonna take the 15 minute window leading up to a breach and we're gonna use Metron to filter all of the messages, which are hundreds of thousands, um, <clears throat> we're going to filter out all the messages to just the actor who broke in. Right? That's our threat hunting use case. So what we're going to look for, the analytic that, that tends to work in this is, we're going to look at the, the users who are, uh, we're going to look at the distribution of distinct number of machines that users connect to, and we're going to look for deviations in that. So in particular, we're going to look for users who connect to oh, more than five standard deviations more machines than a, distinct number of machines in the median, okay? And in particular, the malicious actor here is U66, so keep that in mind. Actually, before I start, we're gonna, we're gonna actually go through the profile. I'm breaking one of my cardinal rules of actually showing code, but since we're ta I talked about Stellar so much, I figured you might wanna see what it looked like. So we have set up two profiles in order to track this. The first profile is the one to track the number of distinct attempts by user. And we're gonna do this for every user. So user is the actual username. <clears throat> and I only wanna look at um, sources of type authentication records. Right? And I'm gonna construct a hyperlog log plus set at the beginning of every tick. And for every, for every message that comes by, I'm gonna add the IP, the, the, the IP address to the set. Right? So every user is gonna have a separate profile. And at the end of the tick, I'm gonna write out the total, this hyperlog log object, to HBase, and then I'm gonna send back through the topology 
just the cardinality. Because what I need more than just the, high, just the, the set, I also need to be able to trim the statistics, the global statistics about all users. So the second profile is gonna be exactly that. I want to look at the, the, the output of the profiler, so the output of the previous profile, and I wanna look at the attempts by user, right? And at the beginning of the tick, I wanna initiate a stats object, and for every message, I wanna add the total number of connections, the distinct machines. And then at the end of the day, I wanna save off that stats object into HBase. So now, I can, now that I have these save, saved off, I can use this as the messages flow by. So for every message, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a window, and let's say my window in time is gonna be <clears throat> the past week skipping holidays and skipping weekends, right? Um, there's a whole little language that's semi-natural language around specifying windows, which if you're interested in, I could talk about later on. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna grab the profile, the attempts by user. We're gonna get the number of distinct authorization attempts that, that use, this particular user has. We're gonna grab the, um, I also want the distribution. So I'm gonna merge together all the distributions across the time window. And I'm gonna grab the median and the standard deviation. And then when I do my triage, I'm gonna set up two rules. One rule is going to be, if it's more than five standard deviations away, and it's a system user, the second rule is gonna be, if it's more than five standard deviations away, and it's a non-system user. Because what I notice, because I'm a security analyst, <clears throat> in this hypothetical scenario, what I notice is I have a lot of anonymous logins and system user. System users are gonna act very differently than non-system users in that situation. So I wanna separate those out, right? Okay. So I apologize in advance because this is gonna be slightly hard to read, but I will, I'll walk you through it. <clears throat> um, this is our alerts screen, and we designed this in order to, for security analysts who are looking at screens all day in a dark environment, so it's, a, it's dark themed. That will change in the aftermath of this, I suspect. <laughs> so in that 15 minute window, you can see there are 149,000 messages. If I look at just the ones that fit my, there are more than five standard deviations away, my analyst has to look at 100, 1,500 messages, individual alerts. That's untenable, absolutely untenable. So what I've done is I've ranked the scores. So if it's just, if it's a system user, it's a score 10. Because maybe it is a problem. Maybe they're, they've broken into a system user account. Maybe not. But if it's a non-system user, it's 100. So if I refine that to 100, I get a much more sensible 92. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but every one is U66. So we've picked out U66 as traffic from amongst over 150,000 in that 50 minute window with no false positives for just this particular instance. So this is one instance of threat hunting that I wanted to kind of demonstrate. And, oops. With that, I'm gonna take some uh, questions, and please don't forget to come to the Models of Service talk tomorrow, as well as the Cybersecurity Bird of a Feather session at the end of the day on Thursday. So anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh, what you showed us was uh, going back to history. Yes. Does it also support seeing things in real time? So the question is, what I showed was going back in history. Does it support seeing the things in real time? So it, those, those dashboards are, are updating in real time, right? So as the, data, as the data is flowing by, you are snapshotting and constructing those alerts. So this is not a batch system. This is entirely streaming. So the dashboards are going to be updated in real time, if that makes sense. And, and what is the delay between uh, receiving a message initially in Kafka and when you're seeing it show up on the screen? So what's the delay between when you see the message in Kafka and when you see it in the dashboard, um, it's on the order of, I would say, of seconds to get through the topologies. Uh, otherwise, we can't keep up with Kafka, right? The idea is to keep up with Kafka. So some of our other topologies are the PCAP topology. We ingest routinely about a gigabit per second. So this is, this is built to handle um, low latency scale, right? Yes? Most of which 
you guys have been doing more in the store arena. I'm just trying to see, like, does okay. that play into it in some way, in some integration? Yeah, so is there an integration? So the question is, what's the deal with Elasticsearch and HDFS and that integration? How, how, how do we play? How do we play nicely inside the ecosystem? So the, the reason, so we want to secure your data lake, so we want that cold storage. We want the events to, to be written out to HDFS. Because what you want to, you're going to want to do is when attacks happen and you're going to miss them, what you want to go back, you want to, what you want to be able to do is to go back and look for things that you missed. Okay, I now know more than I knew three months ago, so I want to go back three months and write Spark jobs or Hive queries or whatever. I want to be able to build machine learning models with historical data. I want to be able to back test those, those machine learning models, et cetera. So that's the play inside of HDFS, right? Um, <clears throat> Elasticsearch, we use Elasticsearch or Solar as a real-time index to drive dashboards. So those are, those are sliced and diced on a, in a time window. So you're only going to be looking back so far for those alerts. But the cold storage is going to be there forever, or for as long as you want to keep it, if that makes sense. That was coming from Elasticsearch. Yeah. Yes. Two questions. First one is, um, Metro is more with that with Lambda or Kappa? Kappa, I would say. Though I would not, so we're, there's some problems. Because keep in mind, what we want to be able to do is to replay data, right? And those profiles pose a challenge for replaying data, I would say. But right now, we are very associated with Kappa. I would not be surprised if we have some elements of Lambda that get folded in here and there, in particular to be able to run, the, to be able to run historical records um, if we want to do different transformations and things like that. So that's the only caveat, I would say. But right now, we're very much associated with Kappa. The second question is, what are you just launch at the, the product called SAM? Yes. So um, we're looking at SAM very, very closely. Um, we have good relationship with the SAM team. Uh, the SAM product manager used to be our product manager, so we, we know those guys very well. Um, and in particular, there's some stuff that's going to be pulled from Metron into SAM and to, cr cross, to, to cross enable it. Things like Stellar, you'll see, you'll see that in SAM eventually. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so SAM's a, diff a different space. This is really more of a security space. SAM, SAM right now, the architecture is, there, there's, a few, there's a few differences, right? They're, they're focusing on schema, right? We, are, we let users really define the schema right, right now for, for themselves. So if I add a new field, I want, to, I want to not have to add it to a schema registry. I want to be able to add a new field live, add a new enrichment live without bringing anything down. SAM is still a configure and then deploy scenario which is a more traditional approach, we're a deploy and then configure scenario. So we want to be able to run these things in live. The other thing is SAM is about building, you know, um, building your pipelines and being able to do that easily. The idea here is to have fixed apologies where we, we can plug in enrichments, new enrichments, without having to shift the topology around. We would like users to not have to know that what their topologies look like. Hopefully, the only people who know what the topologies look like are the committers and the people who are silly enough to go to my talks. <clears throat> so I hope that answered your question. But that's not to say that there won't be movements in either direction going forward around SAM. Good, good question. Yes? Are there any production requirements for anyone using it? There are. So um, <clears throat> Telstra came out, uh, which is a large ISP in, um, in Australia. They came out and supported Metron. They're, it's on their plans to support Metron as their primary um, cybersecurity threat finding tool. They had, there was an Info World article about that a few months back, right before we, we, um, we came out. We, uh, we do have other, I mean, we, do, we are supported by, by Hortonworks, so we have other people using us, which we can't talk about, unfortunately. This data was super small. This is just a VM, right? So it's like it's a just the 15-minute window back. But um, our internal lab is where we do scale testing is around six clusters on UCS hardware, Cisco UCS hardware, and we're able to easily keep up with for PCAP ingestion. We're able to keep up with a gigabit per second with no problem whatsoever. Um, and for regular for, for for regular enrichments, we we can also keep up with. Um, Bro and NetFlow data from YAF 
being driven by a gigabit per second link with no problem on six nodes. I hope that gives you some, some idea of the scale. Six nodes, that includes uh, HBase, Kafka. Yeah. Six nodes, which includes HBase, Kafka, uh, HDFS, um, Elasticsearch. Storm. Storm, yes. All the different things that we talked about there. Yes. Obviously, the more nodes you throw at it, it should linearly scale out is the goal. But yeah, we went through the, it's, it also, for the, I get this question a lot, it also fully supports Kerberos. Uh, there's a Ambari impact for it for installation, for easy installation. Um, all of that good stuff of being a good Hadoop ecosystem, you know, application. Documentation. There's, there's even a couple of documentations. <laughs> There is some documentation, yes. And a follow on, I think the gentleman asked about the, the overlap with spam and, and this. And yes. See some are similar overlap with NiFi, mini NiFi, and such in the way of describing things, how you spark and how you enrich. Yes. So um, we are good friends with the NiFi guys. Very good friends, actually. Um, so. NiFi is a very important part of the ecosystem, in particular to get the data to Kafka for us. For the enrichment, we live and exist outside of the edge. We, the, the differentiation is that NiFi is, a, is, is really largely about getting data to the edge, for, from the edge into the cluster. We're about taking that handoff. In, in, the, relay, in the relay race of Hadoop, we're the, kind of the second leg of NiFi, right? We take the handoff here and we're able to do things like more of the historical enrichment, the machine learning models, the stuff that we're, we're not able to, we're able to assume that we're existing inside of a cluster, right? So the more advanced enrichments, whereas NiFi would do kind of point-wise enrichments, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, uh, we are out of time, actually. I have to take those questions. No problem. Thanks.